Welcome to Science Headliners. Our discussion today is with Steve Sasson. Please welcome our host from Linda Hall Library, Vice President for Public Programs, Eric Ward. Steve Sasson, a native of Brooklyn, New York, graduated with both a bachelor's and master's degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and landed a job at a research laboratory at the Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York. In December 1975, while at Eastman Kodak, he invented the world's first digital camera, which 35 or so years later has not only revolutionized photography, but also the social fabric of the world. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It's an honor to have you uh, oh, join hey, me. It's great to be here. Good to see you again. I want to start, uh, let's go back to 1975. And if you don't mind me saying this, you were 25 years old. You had been at, uh, you had been at Eastman Kodak for, I think, a couple of years. Uh, and, and of course, Kodak was a, a major film company. Um, how did the idea of experimenting with digital photography come about? Well, actually, it came about quite naturally. Um, when I arrived at Kodak, I was, uh, as you mentioned, a young engineer, an electrical engineer, and um, I was interested in how light affected silicon. I had done that at college. And so when they offered me the opportunity to play with a new type of imaging device called a charge couple device, uh, that had just become commercially available, um, uh, I, I jumped at the chance and I thought, well, a way to evaluate this device is to measure the output and to measure the output, it might be best to digitize it, to turn the output into the analog output into numbers. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to analyze it, it might be nice to store the images. And then pretty soon I came up with the idea of trying to build a camera or a picture taking device that would uh, capture images uh, using this solid state imager and store them digitally. And then of course, naturally when you have an image, you want to see it. So I thought I'd have to build another device that would allow me to display it and display it electronically and display it electronically on a television set. So that was kind of the idea. Um, and it took me about a year's worth of work in a back laboratory to try this idea. And uh, we ended up taking our first pictures uh, in December of 1975. And it was that prototype that we demonstrated to the management of Eastman Kodak Company and suggested that this might be a, an alternative way to take pictures in the future. Now, digital cameras today, you know, look a lot like the cameras of old. Uh, it's just instead of a film back, there's a, there's a SD card. What did your, but what did your prototype look like? What, what were the main components of it? Well, my prototype didn't look anything like the nice camera you just showed. Um, and most prototypes don't actually. Uh, prototypes are really the first manifestation of an idea, you know, the first physical implementation of your concept. And uh, mine was, it looked like kind of an erector set, just a bunch of uh, metal box that we put together uh, that would unfold so I could work on all the circuits and do all my building in that. And then I could fold it up and it would become sort of a portable type device. Oh, it was about the size of a toaster um, and it weighed about eight and a half pounds and it had a lens on it and it, and it had a, a, a Philips cassette, like a, a tape cassette where I would store the images digitally on a, digital, on a cassette. Um, and so uh, it was purely functional. You know, I, I never thought anybody would be interested in how this thing looked. I, I was just trying to get something portable that I could take pictures. Uh, so it was a very odd looking contraption, but that's pretty typical for prototypes. Does that prototype survive today? Actually, it does. Um, and it, it probably shouldn't. Um, you, you typically, when you do something like this, you're supposed to uh, get rid of the prototypes just because you're not supposed to, it's, a, it's an accounting issue with respect to research dollars for big companies. But you know, I had such fun building this thing that I kept it and I kept it for years and years and I put it in my drawer, I, I put it in my file cabinet at work and I even lost it a few times as I moved from job to job over the years. And it wasn't until, oh, many years later I would say it wasn't until 
I, the camera was operational in 1976, and it wasn't until the year 2001 that um, uh, I was asked to speak about this camera. I couldn't talk about any of this work up to that point. And then they asked me if I still had it, and it turns out I did. And uh, then some people took pictures of it. And now, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's still the property of Eastman Kodak Company, and it rests in uh, a museum they have for Kodak history uh, here in Rochester, New York. Uh, so it still exists. Um, and um, <laughs> it's, it's really kind of a funny story that it still does, actually. How many megapixels was it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, megapixels might be the wrong way to measure this. This was 100 pixels by 100 pixels. That was the matrix of photo sensors that I was using. So that's 10,000 or 0 0.01 megapixels. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, <laughs> to use the term megapixels with this is a real overstatement. It was, uh, it took, and they were only black and white pictures as well. So it was just a concept. I would take pictures of people and show them to them in a conference room and just talk about how this might evolve into, into future development. Could you, did you imagine or could you imagine at the time um, what it could become, what digital photography could become? Well, actually, you know, when I took the first demonstrations and I took pictures of people at Kodak and we talked about this, um, there was a lot of pushback because obviously the prototype looked very strange. The pictures weren't very good compared to photographic film. Um, and obviously it was uh, very experimental. But I always thought that um, it had a path forward. Um, and I always worked on digital imaging. I always asked to work on it and they always let me work on it. So my whole career at Eastman Kodak Company, even though it was over 35 years in length at Kodak, um, I worked exclusively in digital imaging that whole time because I always felt that there was a big future for, for digital imaging. Now, it was a long way away, and I must say, when they asked me when, when did I think this concept would be viable for the consumer, I came up with an estimate of being 15 and 20 years, which is a long time when you're standing yeah. in front of a bunch of managers inside a company uh, telling them about a big change that might be coming to their business. Um, but I knew it would take a long time. But I, I kind of never gave up on the idea. And uh, like I said, I worked exclusively in that area my whole career. Was it difficult to get uh, management at Kodak to uh, you know, buy into the digital concept? Well, uh, yes and no. Um, they never stopped us from doing research on it. Um, I, like I said, I worked on it, and many, many people at Kodak worked in digital imaging over the years. And they created quite an interesting intellectual property trail uh, that, that is the pa series of patents mm -hmm. that define digital photography and turned out to be a, a very good licensing opportunity for the company in later years, uh, because most other companies had to license the concepts that were developed at Kodak around digital photography. However, um, it was very difficult to introduce product, uh, at least in the early days, simply because uh, it was new and it might in some way af adversely affect the sale of the present photographic medium, which was film and paper. So although we spent a lot of money doing research and development, we weren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, and like I mentioned, I wasn't allowed to talk about any of my work until the year 2001. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so the answer is sort of mixed. Um, they supported it with a lot of R&D dollars, uh, but when you tried to go public with this, uh, it was, uh, there was a bit of resistance to introducing products around this approach, at least in the early years. That was, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I was, I was going to follow up and ask about, uh, you know, why, uh, why you weren't allowed to talk about it for so long. But it, it was the, uh, the intellectual property um, privacy. Well, it, so, it, was, it was to some extent that. But we, we were filing patents, so filing patent applications throughout the 80s and certainly very heavily in the 90s. Um, but what the danger is, and, and I think this happens to almost any time... Uh, you have an established organization that has an established product portfolio and established public perception of what they offer the customer. That if there's a change coming, that you don't want to disrupt the, the, uh, the present business model with the new business model before the new business model looks like it's as a, at least attractive or more attractive than the existing mm -hmm. business model. And with digital photography, that was always difficult. Photographic film and photographic paper 
or a very profitable product for consumers. Everybody had to uh, buy the film every time they took pictures. Um, and Kodak uh, was one of the few people that could make good photographic film and paper. And so they, they made a lot of money off of that. And so when we talked about digital, which didn't require film or didn't require photographic paper, uh, they kept saying, well, where's the, how are we going to replace the revenue stream by introducing this new product? And that was always a difficult discussion because there really wasn't one. Um, and so um, that was really the main pushback on it. And it created all kinds of challenges inside the company. They had to form whole new business units that would go and open up new marketing channels just for digital so that they wouldn't compete with the film oriented marketing channels. Right. So that was really the main problem. You mentioned CCDs earlier, and, and that was the new technology at the time in the early 70s. Um, so if you would have been, for example, 10 years older and arrived at Kodak in the mid-1960s instead of the 70s, uh, would it have been possible for you to, to invent the digital camera? Or were you there at the right time? And yeah, right, right time and right place. Um, the, the CCD was only invented, I think, in 1969 by two people named Boylan Smith that worked at Bell Labs. Uh, they had come up with this concept, and there really wasn't a practical implementation that is one that some, an engineer could take and work with until the early 1970s. So if, if, we had, if I had gone there 10 years earlier, that wouldn't have existed, in addition to a lot of the digital technology that I used to record uh, and di digitize and manipulate the image uh, at the time, that really wouldn't have been available to me either. So, so it was just that I arrived at the right time and uh, I had the right set of uh, interests and discovered this passion for trying to build this, this new thing uh, that, that allowed me to make uh, the contribution we're talking about today. I remember when you spoke at the Linda Hall Library uh, several years ago, you told a story about the, I believe it was the CCDs, where it, you know, it was so new that uh, when you received them, the, the, a technician had written uh, voltage measurements or something on, on, on the packaging and, and, and wrote uh, and then added, good luck. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty typical. You know, when you're doing, let's call it cutting edge research, that is you're, you're playing with something for the very first time um, and, and you're taking parts from vendors that are making their very parts for the very first time, you very often get um, uh, parts that are, um, uh, well, they're, they're a little bit skeptical, okay? Uh, and, and that was the way with CCDs. They were, they, they were basically analog devices that had a digital clocks to them, but the output was analog pulses that corresponded to the intensity of the light that was at that particular pixel for the integration period. And um, in order to get the, these charged pixels out, you had to clock them out. And, and it was a very, um, uh, let's, say, let's say, challenging structure they had to build on the chip. And so when I got the CCD, the story that you're relating was um, when I got the CCD, it was the company made it was called Fairchild. And uh, it came in a plastic box and it was sitting in some styrofoam. When you opened it up, on top of it was a piece of paper folded with uh, 12 different voltage measurements uh, designations. And next to each one written in pencil was where that particular device, the one that was in the box you were holding in your hand at the present time, uh, worked when it left the factory. So it was very individually uh, calibrated. And, um, and then at the bottom it said, good luck, because <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly, if any one of those voltages varied even a slight amount, you simply got no output. And, and it was up to you to figure out which one of the voltages was off uh, or had moved, or, or even the designation had changed as a result of the operating mode that you were in. So it was a very challenging device to get to work. Uh, and it took us a while to, to, to sort of master how to, how to get this to work. Yeah, I love that story. Uh, let me uh, just ask you a question about your childhood. I, you know, I've, I've hear from a lot of scientists and engineers that, you know, as kids, they were, uh, you know, blowing things up and taking the radio apart and trying to put it back together. Uh, were, does that describe you? Yes. And, and your childhood? And, and, and Steve, 
where I'm going with this is I, I read a story where uh, you did something that the FCC, uh, that caught the FCC's attention. Could you oh, tell that boy. story? Eric, you do your research. <laughs> okay, I have to admit, I have to admit to some of my uh, early indiscretions. Um, yes, I was growing up in Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn, and I used to go around and collect um, old TV sets that people used to throw out by the curb when they were getting rid of them. I drag them home and take the parts off of them and build my projects. And one of the things I wanted to do was build a transmitter. And of course, um, I, I, you realize you, in order to transmit, you have to get a license. And I got a ham radio license, amateur radio. And I did, I did that, but I wanted to build my own equipment. And of course, I really didn't have the uh, theoretical knowledge to really build it correctly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So it turned out that I, um, I got in, uh, I started transmitting uh, what I call, would call AM signal or voice uh, with a microphone, but it was on a portion of the spectrum that you only were supposed to use Morse code on. And so I, I was in the wrong part of the spectrum. And uh, there was an FCC monitoring station out in Snake River somewhere, <laughs> way out west. Anyway, they sent me this note saying you were off the band and I had to I had to show it to my mom and dad because I needed the typewriter to write an explanation to the FCC. And my dad, I remember him, um, he was a longshoreman and he didn't know much about this. And he couldn't understand how his, you know, 15 year old son got in trouble with the federal <laughs> authorities out in Idaho. <laughs> I, mean, I remember telling my mom, I said, how did he get in trouble in Idaho? He's never been to Idaho. I've never been to Idaho. What is this, you know? Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that was my first federal rap, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Um, this year, spring 2021, the Linda Hall Library is sponsoring uh, an inaugural Kansas City Invention Convention. It's going to be an invention competition for uh, students in grades 4 through 12. Uh, Steve, for those students out there who may be watching this, uh, what advice would you have for uh, a young person interested in a STEM career. Oh, wow. That's, a, that's an exciting project that you have there. And I think that's great um, because sometimes uh, inventing is, is sort of a lonely kind of a, a occupation. <laughs> and so by having competitions like you're suggesting, you're getting a chance to not only come up with an idea and express it, but then to show it and to interact with other inventors. And I think that's one of the best things about those kinds of activities is you get a chance to, uh, to, to, to interface with other inventors. And I would say to, to young people, um, don't be afraid of failure. Um, inventors spend a long time, a lot of time being wrong about stuff. Um, and so you, you sort of have to get comfortable with that because every time you make a mistake, you're learning new things. And so it's, you're in the process of learning about new stuff. You're expressing yourself because you've got an idea and you want to try to demonstrate it. You want to sort of bring it to life. And that's what your invention is, is about. So don't be afraid of taking on a challenging occupation, a uh, challenging task. Um, and look for your passions. Um, I would say the most important part about being an inventor is to be passionate about what you're doing and have fun doing it. Because you'll have a lot of failures, but you're going to keep going back and trying it again and again and again. And if you've got a passion for the subject, if you've got some enjoyment doing this, um, you'll keep doing that. And that's the key to success, is to keep trying. As part of the competition, the kids will uh, have to build a prototype of their invention. So I'm looking to forward to seeing what they come up with. Oh, that, that's the best part, because the, the prototypes are usually uh, a little weird looking, okay? Uh, and that's the fun part about it. They haven't really spent a lot of time how it looks. They're just trying to demonstrate this concept that spent most of their time in their, in their mind and now for the first time is being turned into reality. And uh, so it's really fun. You're seeing the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the unmodified thoughts turned into reality for the first time. So prototypes are fun. All right, uh, let me end with uh, three quick questions. Just give me the first thing that, that, that comes to mind. Um, I found a roll of, of film. It, I, I was gonna bring the canister in. It, it's undeveloped film. It, it, it's, it's a green colored uh, roll though, so I didn't bring it in. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you still have uh, film around the house? Well, actually, I, I, started, I started using digital in the late 90s. 
um, because it became really practical. And uh, I, I remember going to Yellowstone uh, for, for a family trip, and that was the first time I brought a digital camera. It was kind of fun. Um, I still have film, but I don't shoot it. Uh, I know people who do, yeah. and uh, you know they're artists and they enjoy it. And I think just that time in the dark room and the ability to handle the physical film is uh, is kind of a, an emotional experience. Um, I've always been kind of a digital guy, I, I, uh, so I, I don't really do much with film. Although I do have a few canisters, they're yellow, but they're <laughs> in my drawer uh, still. So. Question number two, uh, what year did you purchase your first digital camera? Was, was it the late oh, 90s? Yeah, it was in the late 90s. It started getting practical in the late 90s for consumers. Uh, professionals have been doing it since the mid 90s, but um, they were very expensive. And, and, I, and I didn't care about that. And usually, you know, you, when you go on a, a big vacation with your family, you want to make sure the pictures are good. So reliability of digital for consumer really didn't start to hit until I would say 98, 99. And then obviously in the early 2000s, they started to get into a resolution that was uh, at least good enough for the casual photographer. And so that's kind of when I started using it. I, we had built and designed as part of our research cameras much before that. I, first, I built one of the first DSLRs actually in, in 1989, um, but we weren't allowed to take it outside the building or tell anybody about it. Um, so uh, we weren't able to use them as, 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 as consumers. Uh, so it wasn't until the late 90s that I started doing it as, as a consumer. All right, and finally, uh, what's one cool thing that uh, you experienced visiting the president at the White House that uh, people may not know about? Oh, boy, that was a great experience. Um, I, I will tell you, um, boy, don't restrict me to one cool thing. I'll tell two, two, okay. cool, uh, yep. two, two cool things. One is we always think of meeting the president, and it was incredibly a wonderful thing to meet the president. Really was cool. Uh, one of the things you don't know about it is when the president gives you the uh, medal, you're on the stage at the East Room of the White House. But after that, at a separate meeting, you get the chance to meet with the president alone, just you and him, uh, in the Blue Room at the White House, where they take a picture of you. And I chatted with him about innovation and photography. Turns out President Obama likes photography a lot. Uh, <laughs> and so there's that. And then the other aspect of it is, don't forget that you're on stage with some of the greatest inventors in the United States. And you get a chance to meet with them. And before and after the ceremony, you get a chance to talk to the people who invented the microprocessor, who invented um, uh, uh, different forms of, uh, of adhesives and chemicals and, and medical equipment and stuff like that, post-it notes and things. I mean, just terrific. So, so you meet the president, but you also get a chance to meet a whole For bunch sure, of really yeah. big inventors as well. So. Okay, there's two. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for uh, taking the time uh, today to talk with me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see you again. Oh, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, it's, one, it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, I really enjoyed, although many years ago, my visit to Lindholm the library, and it was terrific. Science Headliners has been made possible by the generous donations you make to the Linda Hall Library.